This is my pre-calculus course. Today we're going to learn some more counting problems. If you haven't done the homework completely incorrectly from the last class, do that homework before watching this video. So in the previous class, we learned how uh, to use the multiplication rule to uh, count outcome variations. And we learn how to count outcome variations when repetition is allowed and when the number of options for each choice is the same number and we also learned how to find the number of outcome variations when repetition is not allowed and we found the number of outcome variations when uh, repetition is not allowed and the order of the things doesn't matter so now we're going to learn a few more problems that are a little more complicated. These problems can get quite complicated, but we don't want to uh, spend too much time making these problems convoluted, so we'll just do a few more and then move on. A peace organization has eight doctors, 15 nurses, five scientists, and 10 volunteers with no special skills. The organization will choose a team of six doctors, nine nurses, three scientists, and five volunteers to help sick people in an impoverished country. How many outcome variations are possible for the team that the organization will send? So we have four choices to make. So I'm going to write this down. Choice number one. Choice number two. Choice number three and choice number four and we need to find the the uh, number of options for each choice the first choice that we're going to make is the team of doctors that we're going to send to the impoverished country and we have eight total doctors to choose from but we're only going to send six doctors and we don't care about the order of the doctors. If we have Dr. Stevenson, and then we have Dr. Allen, that's the same thing as switching these around and having Dr. Allen, Allen, Allen and, and Dr. Stevenson. It, does, it doesn't really make a difference, the order of the six doctors. So that's why we, we're going to use uh, we're going to count combinations or groups so we don't care about the permutations of the doctors so this is the number of options in the first choice it's the number of groups of these doctors that we can choose because uh, there's all kinds of different groups of six that we can choose out of the eight so again that number represents all of the uh, different groups of six that we can choose out of the eight. It's the number of options in the first choice. Our first choice being uh, which group of doctors we're going to send. Now we have 15 nurses to choose from and we're going to choose nine nurses. So this is the number of options for the different groups that we can send, the different groups of nine nurses out of 15. So we're going to make our first choice. We have this many options for doctors. Then we're going to make our second choice. We have this many options for the nine nurses that we're going to send. And uh, we have uh, five scientists to choose from. And we're going to choose three out of those five scientists. So this is the number of groups that we can choose. And uh, we have uh, 10 volunteers to choose from, and we're going to send five volunteers. So this is the number of different groups that we can choose for choice number four. So just to be clear, we're making four choices. The first choice is what group of doctors we're going to send. The second choice is what group of nurses we're going to send. The third choice is what group of scientists are we going to send? And the fourth choice is what group of volunteers we're going to send? We've got all these different options for the, the groups that we're going to choose. Because we don't just have six doctors, we have eight. We have 15 nurses, not nine. We have five scientists, not three. 
we have 10 volunteers, not five. So we have options as to which uh, groups that we're going to send because we're not going to send all these people. So remember in the previous class we did that problem where we had to choose the the type of cheese and there were three types of cheeses and then we had to type uh, we had to choose the type of bread there were four types of bread and then we had to uh, choose the type of meat there were two types of meat so we have the first choice three options the second choice four options and the third choice two options we multiply all those together to get the total number of sandwich variations that are possible we're doing the same thing here we're multiplying the number of options for each choice so I'm going to use a multiplication symbol and it's easiest to go to the calculator to find these numbers so I'm going to enter 8 in my TI-84 plus then the math button then the right arrow key to PRB and then I'm going to do uh, press the down arrow key to uh, NCR and enter and I'm going to enter 6. So in your calculator you should have 8 NCR 6 and then press enter and we get 28. So there's 28 options for uh, uh, groups of 6 doctors out of the 8 that we can choose from. And I'm going to do the same thing for the next number of options. We have 5,000 five different options of nine uh, nurses that we can choose out of 15 and then uh, we have 10 uh, scientists or there's 10 groups of scientists that we can choose if we're going to choose three scientists out of five so 10 different options and then we have uh, 252 options of volunteers that we can choose given that we're choosing five volunteers from from a pool of ten people and of course we're multiplying all these we're using the multiplication principle so if we multiply all these numbers we get 353 million 152,800 outcome variations. So that is the answer. Let's try another one of these problems. Um, there are 28 band members at Rock Ridge High School, 33 at Sierra High, and 30 at El Dorado High. The band director from Rockridge will choose seven students to play in a district honor band. The Sierra band director will choose ten students to play in this same honor band. And El Dorado, the El Dorado director will choose twelve students. How many outcome variations are possible for the honor band? That is twenty-nine students because there's going to be seven chosen and ten chosen and twelve chosen which is a total of uh, 29 students for this honor ban okay so we're gonna do it the same way we did it before we have a number of choices to make each choice is the group of people that we're going to send but in this case we only have three choices to make so I can erase choice number four and the first choice is going to be 28, uh, choose 7. That's one way that you can say this, 28, choose 7. It means uh, how many groups of 7 can you choose from 28 distinct things. And then we have uh, 33 students at Sierra High School. And we're going to choose 10 students out of the 33 and then we have uh, 30 students at El Dorado High School and we're going to choose 12 students out of the uh, 30 students so let's calculate this looks like for the uh, first choice we have 
we have 1,184,040 different options. And for the second choice, we have 92 million options. And for the third choice, we have 86 million options. So we're going to multiply all of these numbers together. Now this number is going to be so big that we're going to have to use something called scientific notation. So we're going to write 9.4793092221 and it's going to say E21 in your calculator, E21. So you'll see, I'll make it red just so you can see, it's going to say E and it's going to say 21 there. So what that means is times 10 to the 21st power. And what that does is it makes it to where we don't have to write so many zeros. So when you multiply by 10 to the 21st power, you move the decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 times to the right. So there should be uh, 12 more zeros here, but we don't, have to, we don't want to write all those zeros. So scientific notation is a way to write really big numbers or really small numbers, in this case really big numbers. So that's how many outcome variations there are. Okay, so uh, let's try another one of these. Corey has 36 baseball cards, 24 football cards, 18 hockey cards, 30 Pokemon cards, and 20 basketball cards. Each card is unique. He wants to show some of his cards to his fellow students at school, but he does not want to take all of them. He decides to take four baseball cards, two football cards, five hockey cards, two Pokemon cards, and five baseball cards, or basketball cards. How many ways can he do this? In other words, how many outcome variations are there for the cards that he chooses to take? So again, it's just the same principle here. We have a number of choices to make. In this case, it's going to be five choices. Because he's bringing quite a few different types of uh, cards. And the first choice is going to have 36 um, choose four. So he's going to choose four of the 36 baseball cards. And he's then going to choose two of the 24 football cards. And he's going to choose five of the eight, 18 hockey cards and he's going to choose uh, two of the 30 Pokemon cards and then he's going to choose um, uh, five of the 20 basketball cards so now let's go to the calculator we get 58,000 options for this first choice, 58,905 options and then we get 276 options for the second choice and 
8,568 options for the third choice. And 435 options for the fourth choice. And 15,504 options for the fifth choice. So now we're going to multiply all these numbers and we'll see what we get. So again, it's going to be beneficial to use scientific notation. So we get 9.394500998 times 10 to the 17th power. Outcome variations, or you could say ways, ways that he can uh, choose to present his cards. So there you go. Okay, so again, if you see E, if you see E here, and then an, uh, a 10 to the sum, or, uh, or uh, you know, some, some number after the E, so E and then some number after the E, that means times 10 to whatever that number is power. So go ahead and try number four. And uh, when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So it looks like he is going to make one choice here and then the second choice here. Um, third choice and then fourth choice and fifth choice. So he's going to make five choices. So Let's bring our choices down here. So on the first choice, um, he's got five different options, or five, five things to choose from, and he's going to choose three out of those five. And uh, his mom said he can choose four new video games out of the ten that are available. Um, or the, the ten that he likes. And two places to order food out of, the, out of his six favorite restaurants. Um, and then three muscle man figures out of the ten available. And, and uh, five baseball cards out of the nine that he likes. So let's do these calculations. So we get 10 options in the first choice. And 210 options in the second choice. And then we get 15 options in the third choice. And then we get 120 options in the fourth choice. And then we get 126 options in the fifth choice. So multiplying all these together, we get Um, 476 million, uh, 280,000, uh, outcome variations. So if you got that right, excellent. So we use the multiplication principle 
for counting. We multiplied all of the options in each choice to determine how many different outcome variations there are. And the number of options for each choice was determined by figuring out how many ways you can choose three distinct things out of five, four distinct things out of ten, six distinct things out of uh, or two di distinct things out of six, three distinct things out of ten, and five distinct things out of nine. So you can take a picture of these problems if you want to help you with number five. Try number five. When you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So it looks like she's going to have one, two, three, four choices to make. So the first choice is going to be, uh, she's going to choose five pairs of pants out of the 12 that she owns, and then she's going to choose seven shirts out of the 21 that she owns. Then she's going to choose uh, four pairs of shoes um, from the nine that she owns. And then she's going to choose three hats um, from the 13 that she owns. So let's calculate these numbers. So 12 choose 5. There's 792 different ways that she can choose um, five pairs of pants out of 12. And there's 116,280 different ways that she can choose seven shirts out of uh, 21 possible. And again, the, the shirts are, are assumed to be all distinct and all different. And then there's 126 different ways that she can choose um, four pairs of shoes out of the nine pairs that she has. And there's 286 ways that she can choose three hats out of the 13 that she has. So if you multiply all these numbers together, we're going to get a pretty big number. So we're going to have to use scientific notation which is a way to write really big or really small numbers. By using 10 to some power. So if you got that answer, good. So 3.318690735 times 10 to the 12th power. Okay, so I want you to try number six. And when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. Um, so it looks like we have three options, or excuse me, three choices to make in this last problem. Um, so he's going to choose um, let's see, four dimes out of the seven that he has. That's the number of options in the first choice. Um, then he's going to choose uh, two pennies out of the four that he has. And he's going to choose three quarters out of the five quarters that he has. Okay, so let's calculate these numbers. Uh, 
we have 35 options in the first choice. And then we have six options in the next choice. And then we have 10 options in the next choice. So if we multiply all these together, we get 2,100 uh, outcome variations for uh, Jesse's coin presentation. So if you got that right, excellent. excellent. So those are just some more challenging problems uh, that you'll see. We could do some problems where we had to count permutations or some problems where repetition was allowed, but those problems become very difficult to write and so you're probably not going to see those very often. We just used uh, or we did problems with groups. So we wrote C instead of P. Um, so again, uh, the, these were grouping problems. We found the number of groups of certain things and then we used the multiplication rule. Okay, so Um, now we're going to learn about sets. A set is just a collection of things. For example, people with brown hair, that's, that's, you could consider that to be a set. Or odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine, that's a, a set of, of things. Sets are often notated with capital A, capital B, so capital A would be a set of things, capital B would be a set of things. Capital A could be a, the, uh, all of the birds in the world, that's a set of something. Or capital B could be the numbers 3, 6, 11, 15, that's a set of numbers. We could even say C is all the athletes in the world. Now the intersection of sets is uh, all of the things that are common to two sets. So for example here we have a set of numbers and then in purple we have a, another set of numbers and the intersection of the blue and purple sets is simply the numbers that are in common. So the intersection would be 3 comma 4. Why is that? Well, um, we have 3 and 4 here, and then we have 3 and 4 here, but there's no other numbers that are common. So the intersection of those two sets is 3 comma 4. The numbers or the things inside a set are also called elements. You could say that these are the elements in common. So these are all the elements of set A, these are all the elements of set B, the elements in common are 3 and 4. So as you can see this is pretty easy. Let's find the intersection of set A and B in problem number 8. So the intersection is going to be negative 6, 7, um, actually 5, and by the way you don't have to write the numbers in ascending order but it just helps us to write in ascending order uh, helps us to organize the numbers and what else do we have here so we got 7 we got negative 6 and we got 5 and 18 is not common to both of them so it looks like that's going to be it that is the intersection of set A and set B and I forgot to rectangle that answer up there. Okay, let's do number nine. What is the intersection of set A and B? And as you can see, there are no numbers common in set A and B. So we say that 
the intersection is equal to what we call the empty set. That means that uh, the intersection doesn't exist. There are no elements in that set, the intersection of A and B. This is all also called the null set. Null means nothing. There's nothing there. It's empty set or the null set. So I want you to try number 10. As you can see, these problems are pretty easy. Try number 10. When you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So the intersection of sets A and B is 11, 12, 13, and 14. So these are common with these, but 15 and 16 and 10 are not common to both, to both sets. So if you got that right, good. Try number 11. When you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So it looks like we only have one number that's common to both sets. So the intersection of sets A and B is 99. If you got that right, good. Go ahead and try number 12, and when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So it looks like the intersection is going to be 80 and 81. We didn't have enough room to write down there, so we went to the next page. So if you got that right, excellent. Okay, so we learned the intersection of sets. That's the, the things that are common in two sets. We're also going to learn something called the union of sets. So the union is everything that's in one set plus everything that's in the other set. So the union is basically just everything. It's when you combine two sets. And notice that the intersection of two sets was notated with an upside down U. But here, the union is notated with a right side up U. So that's very important. You see the problems that we did previously. You see the green? that U is upside down. That's the intersection of two sets. But when you see the U right side up, that's the union of two sets because we're actually combining the two sets. So we have one and two. I got those from here. But we also have three and four. They both have three and four. But the set at the right has 5, 6, and 7. So I combined all the numbers from every, uh, or from both sets to make a, a big unionized set. Alright, that's when a group of people get together. That's called a union. So, let's try uh, number 14. We're going to take all the elements in every set and put them together so we get negative 6, 3, 5, <clears throat> 7, and it uh, looks like we have negative 5, 2. And you don't, like I said, you don't have to write in ascending order, but it's better to just organize things that way. And then we have 18, and I think that might be it. So negative 6, negative 6, 3, negative 5, and um, 5, and 7, and 18. So it looks like we got everything. So again, you combine the two sets to make one big uh, union set where everything from each set is represented. So let's try one more of these before you try one on your own. Actually, uh, why don't you go ahead and try 15. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. 
Okay, so we have negative 10 and 3, 8, 20, 22, and I forgot uh, 17. And uh, 100, and I think that's going to be it. So that's the union of these two sets. So let's make sure we got everything. It's very easy to miss some of these numbers. So we got 8, we got 17, we got 20, we got 22, and we got 100. All right, so if you got that one right, excellent. Go ahead and attempt number 16. And when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So we're going to combine set A and set B to find the unionization of those two sets. So let's write in uh, ascending order. So the smallest number is 98, then we have 99, um, then we have uh, 100, and then we have 200, and 200, and 1. So just to make sure that we got all these, I'm going to double check. So 98, 99. 100, um, 200, and then 201. So we got that right. Excellent. Okay, so um, now we're going to introduce something called Venn diagrams. And Venn diagrams are used to help us group things together. So A would be this whole circle here. We represent this circle as a group of things. And B would be this whole circle here. And the intersection of A and B is this part here. And usually the rectangle represents uh, everything that can possibly be chosen in the particular example that we're doing. So a Venn diagram is a visual representation that helps us to group things together. And it's easier to show you a problem rather than to uh, explain further. So it says here, use Venn diagrams to solve the following problems. There are 32 students in a class. 20 of them like math. 14 of them like art. And eight of them like both. How many students like math only? Um, well, this seems like a pretty difficult problem, but if we use a Venn diagram, it actually makes the problem pretty easy. So we're going to start with the, uh, well, first let's, let's label some things. So uh, we're going to label this circle M, the students that like math. So all of these students in this circle are the students that like math. We're going to label the other student A for art. So all the students uh, that like art are in this circle. And we're told that both, uh, or the students that, that like both, well, they're going to be in the intersection, this middle area. That's, we're told that's eight students like both math and art. So to help us do this problem, we're going to take the number of students that like math, 20, and we're going to subtract the number of students that like both art and math, and that gives us the number of students that only like math. So 20 minus 8 
is 12. That's the answer for the first part. Then we're going to take the students that like art. That's all these students here. That's 14 students that like art, but we're going to subtract the students that like both art and math. So 14 minus 8 is equal to 6. So that gives us the answer to the second question. There's six students that only like art. Now, notice that the sizes of the circles are not proportional to the numbers of students that the circles represent. So uh, the areas of the circles in the rectangle uh, are not going to be proportional to the number of students in them. That's not the point of Venn diagrams. The point of Venn diagrams is simply to keep track of how many things are in each group. We don't care about uh, proportionality when it comes to uh, Venn diagrams. And then we're asked how many students like either math or art. So that's where we use the equation that we learned up here. But we don't really need to use the equation. We can just add up the, these numbers. So 12 plus 8 plus 6 is equal to 28 students. Or excuse me, 26 students that like either math or art. It's very important to understand that in counting and probability, the words and and or mean very specific things. And the terminology can be kind of confusing, but you need to understand that when you say or, you're talking about uh, all of the things in two groups. So if you say all of the students that liked either math or art, what you mean is all of the students that have at least one of those characteristics. So that's including the students that only like art, the students that only like math, and the students that like both of them. That's what either or means in counting problems. Whereas if you're saying uh, students that liked uh, both math and art, you're only talking about the students that like both of them. So just be aware that, again, with counting problems and probability problems, uh, the words and and or mean very different things. So 12 that like math, 6 that like art, and 8 that like both. So that falls under the either or uh, category. So this language is pretty confusing, I know. But uh, that's, that's what that's asking. How many students like neither math nor art? So in order to figure that out, we take the total number of students in the class, and then we subtract the ones that like either art or math, and we get six. Six students, and we can write the six out here. They're in the classroom, so the, the yellow rectangle would be the entire classroom. The six students out here don't like math or art, but all the students in here like math, all the students in here like art, and the students in the intersection like math and art. So as you can see, this is, uh, this is pretty easy. The Venn diagram helps us to see. If we don't have the Venn diagram, then it becomes very difficult to uh, figure this out. We could do it, but it, the Venn diagram just makes it easier for us. Okay, a tech factory makes 100 calculators one day. 17 of the calculators are non-functional. 21 of them have scratches, and 10 of them are non-functional with scratches. So, how many calculators are functional but have scratches? Well, first we label things. Um, I'm going to say N for non-functional and S for scratches. We're told that 10 of them are non-functional and they have scratches, so I'm going to write 10 inside here. Now 17 are non-functional. 
So that's all of these. There's 17 total that are non-functional. If we subtract the 10 from the 17, we get 7 that are only non-functional. So um, that looks like that's going to be the answer to the second question. 17 minus uh, 10 is 7. And the answer to the second question is going to be what's in here. So we're going to take the number that have scratches. 21 of them have scratches. And then we're going to subtract the ones that have scratches and are non-functional and we get 11. So 21 minus 10 is 11. How many calculators have either scratches or are non-functional? Um, so that's just the sum. That's the ones that only ha are non-functional, the ones that uh, have scratches and are non-functional, and the ones that are only that only have scratches. So that is 28 calculators that are either non-functional or have scratches. How many calculators have no scratches and are operational? OK, so that's going to be the outside, inside the rectangle, but outside of the circles. So we take the total number of calculators, 100, and then we subtract 28 which is all, all the numbers that are inside the circles, the number of things inside the circles. And we get 72 calculators. All right. So there you go. Now notice that the circles are not proportional to the number of things that are represented by the circles. So um, we're not really talking about actual area in relation to the number of things inside each circle. So that's not what the Den the, the uh, Venn diagrams are for. So let's try one more of these problems. An aviary has 300 parakeets. 180 have white feathers, 80 have blue feathers, and 50 have white feathers and blue feathers. How many parakeets have white feathers but no blue feathers? So we have white feathered parakeets and blue feathered parakeets, but some of the parakeets have both blue and white feathers. So 50 have white feathers and blue feathers. You're always going to start by filling in the inner part here. So 50 have white and blue feathers. If 180 have white feathers, then we subtract 50 from that to get 130. And if 80 have blue feathers, we're going to subtract 50 from that to get 30 that have only uh, blue feathers. So how many parakeets have white feathers but no blue feathers? We take 180 and subtract 50, and we get 130 parakeets. How many parakeets have blue feathers but no white feathers? So we take 80 and then subtract 50, and we get 30. How many parakeets have either white or blue feathers? So that's the ones that have white feathers, the ones that have blue feathers, and the ones that have both. So 130 plus 50 plus 30 is equal to 210 parakeets. All right, and how many parakeets have no white or blue feathers? So in order to find that, we take the total number of parakeets in the aviary and subtract 210, because 210 represents all of the parakeets that have white or blue feathers. And we get 90. So there you go. OK, so you can take a picture of these pages if you'd like. Take a picture of that page and a picture of that page and a picture of this page to help you. Try number 20. When you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So let's fill in our Venn diagram. So cruise control and sunroofs. And 20 of them have both cruise control and sunroof. So always start with the intersection. 
how many trucks have sunroofs but no cruise control. So we're going to take uh, 28, 28 trucks that have uh, sunroofs and we're going to subtract the ones that have sunroofs and cruise control and we get 8 trucks that have only uh, sunroofs. So then we're going to uh, take the total number of trucks that have cruise control, which is 109. And then we're going to subtract the ones that have cru cruise control and sunroofs. And then we get um, 89 trucks that have only cruise control. We want to know how many trucks have either sunroofs or cruise control, so we just add those up. So we have 89 plus 20 plus 8 is equal to, looks like, 117 trucks. Now we need to know how many trucks have neither sunroofs nor cruise control. So we simply take the total number of trucks, 207, and we subtract 117, the number of trucks that have either or. So 207 minus 117 is 90. 90 trucks. Just so happened that we got a, the same number in the previous problem. That was a coincidence. Okay, so if you got those answers, excellent. Go ahead and try number 21, and when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So, some of these family members skied, and some of them uh, fished. Um... 10 did both. So 19 skied. So if we subtract 10 from 19, we get 9. If we subtract uh, 10 from 15, we get 5. So 19 minus 10 is 9. And 15 minus 10 is 5. How many family, family members either fished or skied? So that would be 9 plus 10 plus 5 is 24. How many family members neither fished nor skied? Take the total number of family members and subtract those that either fished or skied. And we get 12. So if you got that right, excellent. Go ahead and try number 22. And when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So we have students that like peanut butter and students that like jelly. How many students like peanut butter but not jelly? Well, that's right the intersection. 14 like both. 78 like peanut butter. So if we subtract 14 from 78, we'll get uh, 60, 64 and if we subtract 24 or subtract uh, 14 from 24 we get uh, 10 so 78 minus um, 14 is 64 and 24 minus 14 is 10. How many students like either peanut butter or jelly? So 64 only liked peanut butter. 14 like both peanut butter and jelly. And 10 just like jelly. So looks like that's going to be 88 students. How many students do not like peanut butter or jelly? So you take the total number of students, which is 100, and subtract the number of students that liked either peanut butter or jelly. So if you got that right, excellent. 
Okay, so now we're going to learn a counting principle that we're going to need for the, the next problems that we're going to do. Uh, but first of all, let's come up with some different notation here. It says up here, if A and B are sets, then N of A is the number of things in A. And N of B is the number of things in B and n of the intersection of a and b is the number of things in both a and in b and n of the union of a and b is the number of things in either a or b so um, if you see an n before the letter that just means we're counting the actual number of things we could be counting the number of, of, of numbers if you have a set, let's say that A is 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, then N of A would be 4 because there's four things, 1, 2, 3, 4, all right? So you're counting the actual number, how many numbers there are in a set or how many things. So there's a principle or an equation we use to find the number of things in the union of A and B, which is this uh, orange here. So the number of things in either A or B is equal to the number of things in A plus the number of things in B minus the intersection. Now why did we have to subtract the intersection? Well because notice that we counted the intersection of A and B here, and we counted it here. We counted it twice. So we don't want to count things twice. So we are just finding uh, the number of things in the, un the union of A and B. Uh, we're not trying to you know, count things more than one. So we're going to use that formula in the next problem. A school requires every student to choose at least one area of science to study. There are 350 students at the school. 200 of them chose either biology or physics. 110 of them chose biology. And 136 chose physics. How many students chose neither physics nor biology? So the 200 represents every single student that chose one of these uh, two fields of study. So if we subtract 200 from the total number of students, that's going to be the students that chose neither, neither of those uh, two uh, areas of study. And so now it wants to know how many students chose both physics and biology. Now this may not be exactly obvious, so we're going to use our formula down here. So the uh, number of students that chose um, either biology or physics the union of those two things is equal to uh, the number of students that chose biology plus the number of students that chose physics minus the number of students that chose both biology and physics. We're looking for this value here. So let's fill in what we know. We know that uh, 200 of them chose either biology or physics. That number represents all of the students that chose at least one of these two subjects. And we also know that uh, 110 of the students chose biology and 136 chose uh, physics. So again, we're looking for the number of students that chose both biology and physics. So we have 246 minus the number of students that chose both 
subjects. Subtract 246 from both sides and divide both sides by negative 1. And we see that the number of students that chose both biology and physics is 46. 46 uh, students chose both. So now the problem wants to know how many students chose biology but not physics. And in order to do this, it may be helpful for us to draw a, a Venn diagram. So we're going to fill in the intersection. That's 46. Um, we know that uh, 110 students chose biology, so if we subtract 46 from 110, we get 64. So that's the number of uh, students that uh, only cho chose biology. So 110 minus 46 is 64. How many students chose physics but not biology? Well, we just take the number of students that chose physics and then subtract the number of students that chose both. So 136 minus 46, which is 90. So those are the students that chose only physics. So I'll write P for physics. And there you go. So there's another type of problem that uh, you may encounter. Let's try number 24. A travel agency checks its records and finds that 24 of its customers have been to Spain and 40 have been to France. 49 have been to either Spain or France. The agency has 77 customers in total. How many customers have been to neither Spain nor France? Well, we just take the total number of uh, customers and subtract the number of customers that have been to one of those two countries, which is the, the customers that have been to either Spain or France. And so that would be 28, 28 customers. Now they want to know how many customers have been to both Spain and France. And this is the one that uh, may take some calculations. So our equation, again, looking at our equation here, the number of customers that uh, have been to Spain or France, either or, one of those two countries, is equal to the number of customers that have been to Spain plus the number of customers that have been to France uh, minus the number of customers that have been to both Spain and France because you're counting those customers twice when you add up this sum. Okay, so we know um, we know the number of customers that have been to one of those countries. That's uh, 49. The, the customers that have been to either Spain or France. That's all of the customers that have been to one of those countries. The number of customers that have been to Spain uh, is a 24. The number that have been to France is 40. And so all we have to do at this point is solve for the unknown, and then we're done. So we have 49 is equal to 64 uh, minus the number of customers that have been to Spain and France. Subtract, and we get negative 15 is equal to negative the number of customers that have been to Spain and France. So now we just divide both sides by negative 1. And let's move this up a little bit. 
and we see that the number of customers that have been to both Spain and France is 15. Now we can use that with a Venn diagram to answer the rest of the problem. How many customers traveled to Spain but not France? So let's label this Spain and this France. And the number of customers that had been to both we just found is 15 in part 2. Um, so how many customers traveled to Spain but not France? So you take the total number of customers that have traveled to uh, Spain, which is 24, and subtract 15, and we get 9. So 24 minus 15 is 9. How many customers have traveled to France but not Spain? So take the total number of customers that have traveled to France, which is 40, and then subtract 15, and we get 25. So the answer is 40 minus 15, which is 25 customers. So there you go. You can take a picture of these problems if you'd like to help you. So go ahead and try number 25, and when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. How many coins are not gold or Spanish? So we take the total number of coins, which is uh, 46, and then we subtract all of the coins that have one of these descriptions. So that's the coins that are either Spanish or gold, and we see we have 17 coins that are not Spanish or gold. Now we're asked how many of Madeline's coins are Spanish and also made of gold. So we're going to use our special equation, the number of coins that are Spanish or made of gold. That means all of the coins that fit this, uh, or fit one of these descriptions, all the coins that have one of these characteristics, is equal to the number of coins that are Spanish plus the number of coins that are made of gold minus the number of coins that are both Spanish and made of gold. Now we're told this information, we're, we're told that 29 of them are either Spanish or gold. So 29 of them have one of those characteristics. The number of coins that are Spanish, we're told is 21, and the number of gold coins is 10. So now all we have to do is solve this equation. So we have 29 is equal to 31 minus the number of coins that are both Spanish and made of gold. Subtract, and we get negative 2 is equal to the negative of the missing value that we're looking for. And divide both sides by negative 1. And we have the number of coins that are both Spanish and gold. So two of the coins are both Spanish and gold. So now we're asked how many coins are Spanish but not made of gold. So we can use a Venn diagram to help us. We know that two of the coins are both Spanish and gold. And we know that 21 of the coins are Spanish, so if we subtract 2, we get 19 coins are just Spanish. They're not, they're not gold. And let's take the 10 coins that are made of gold and subtract 2, and we get the number of coins that are gold, but they're not Spanish coins. Um... So how many coins are Spanish but not made of gold? Um, again, we took 21 and subtracted 2. We got 19. How many coins are made of gold but are not Spanish? We took the total number of gold coins and subtracted the number of gold coins that are, that are Spanish, and we get the number of uh, coins that are gold but not Spanish. 
So if you got those right, excellent. Okay, go ahead and try number 26, and when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. So uh, the restaurant serves 18 types of food, and we know that 16 types have either wheat or beef, which means that there's only two types of food that don't have wheat or beef. How many types of food contain both wheat and beef? So again, using our formula, the number of types of food that contain both wheat or excuse me, the number of types of uh, food that contain wheat or beef is equal to the number of types of food that contain wheat plus the number of types of food that contain beef minus the number of types of food that contain both wheat and beef. So we're given this information. We're told that 16 types have either of those. So 16 types have one of those descriptions, wheat or, or made, of, made of wheat or made of beef. The number of types of food that are made of wheat, we're told uh, is nine. Nine types have wheat and 12 types have beef. So now all we have to do is solve the equation. And we get negative 5 is equal to negative of that expression that we're looking for. Um, divide both sides by negative 1, and we see that there are five types of food that are made of both wheat and beef. So we can draw the intersection there. How many types of food? contain wheat but not beef wheat but not beef um, let's label our circles so wheat and beef so we know that there's uh, nine types of food that have wheat so we subtract five from nine and we get the number of types of food that only contain wheat so 9 minus 5 is 4. How many types of food contain beef but not wheat? Um, so it says up here that 12 types of food have beef. Subtract 5, and we get the, the number of types of food that only contain beef and not wheat. So 12 minus 5 is 7. So if you got that answer, excellent, good job. Okay, so let's go to the next problems. It is possible that you may see a problem that's more complicated. And these problems really are very, very difficult to, to uh, understand in our minds. So a Venn diagram is going to be particularly useful with these. There's 105 farms in the county of Petersburg. 37 of them have cows. 30 of them have chickens. 15 of them have horses and chickens. 12 of them have horses and cows. 8 of them have cows and chickens. Six of them have all three, meaning they have cows, chickens, and horses. Eighteen farms don't have cows, chickens, or horses. How many farms have horses only, meaning horses but no chickens or cows? So how in the world are we supposed to remember all this? Well, that's not very likely, right? That's where a Venn diagram comes into play. So let's label this. We got cows, and we got chickens, and we have horses. Remember, you always start with the intersection. So it says, 
um, eight of eight of the farms have cows. Uh, actually, six of them. Six of them have all three. So that's going to go in there. That's where we always start. We always start with the intersection. Okay, and it says um, we can, we can kind of work backwards here. So eight of the farms have cows and chickens. Eight of the farms have cows and chickens. So that's this part here should be eight. That should be a total of eight. But we already have six here. So in order for it to be a total of eight, you need two farms in there. Okay, so now let's look at this part. Twelve of the farms have horses and cows. Twelve of the farms have horses and cows. So that's this part here. The intersection of the horses and the cows must be 12, but it only has six there, so we need six more. Okay, and what else do we have here? It says 15 of the farms have horses and chickens. 15 of the farms have horses and chickens. So that's this region here, the intersection there. That's 15 total, but we already have six in there. So we need nine more for a total of 15. You see how easy the Venn diagram makes this? So, um, now we're told that uh, 37 of the farms have cows. So all the numbers in this circle have to add up to 37. But we've already got 2, 6, 6. That's a total of 14. So 37 minus 14 is 23. We're told that 30 of, of the farms have chickens uh, have, have chickens. So this circle has to have a total of 30 farms in it. It already has 2, 6, 9, that would be uh, 17. So we take the 30 farms that have chickens and subtract 17, and we get 13 farms that only have chickens. So 20 farms only have cows, 13 only have chickens. And uh, now we're asked to find how many farms have horses only. Well, obviously that would just be this part down here. Um, now, we're told that 18 farms do not have cows, chickens, or horses. So that means 18 goes in the rectangle. Okay, so in order to find the number of uh, farms that only have horses, we have to take the uh, total number of farms 105, subtract those that don't have horses or cows or chickens, and subtract the ones that only have cows, subtract the ones that have only chickens, and basically just subtract every single one of these numbers, and that will leave you with the farms that only have horses. So 105 minus 18 minus 23 minus 13 minus 6 minus 6 minus 2 minus 9 gives us 28 farms that only have horses. So I know that seemed kind of complicated, but again, with the Venn diagram, it's really not that difficult. And I'm going to write uh, 28 because that was our answer. 28 farms only had horses. Okay, let's try another one of these problems. So we're going to start with the union, or the, uh, excuse me, the intersection of everything. It says five homes have all three of these. And what are the three things that they have? They have solar panels 
air conditioning, and a well. So that's five total. We always start with the intersection of everything. And it tells us that eight homes have none of them, so we can actually go ahead and write that first. We didn't do that in the previous problem, but we can do that. And um, seven homes have solar panels and air conditioning. So let's say um, solar panels, air conditioning, and a well. Seven homes have solar panels and air conditioning, so that would be this region here. It's supposed to be seven, but there's only five, so I'll put two more. Um, Seventeen homes have a well and solar panels. So that's this region here should be 17, but there's only five, so we'll add an extra 12 there. And 11 homes have wa a water well and air conditioning. So there should be 11 here total, but there's only five, so we'll put six more there. And we're told that 20 of the homes have air conditioning. So there should be 20 total here, but there's only uh, 13, so we need seven more. And 23 of the homes had solar panels. So there should be 23 in here. But I only see um, 19. So we need four more homes. And so now we're looking for the homes that only have wells. They don't have air conditioning or solar panels. So we take the total number of homes in the town of Louisville and we just subtract all of these numbers. So there should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers that we're subtracting. So 49 minus 8 minus 4 minus 2 minus 5 minus 12 minus 7 minus 6 is 5. There's 5 homes that only have a well, but they don't have air conditioning or solar panels. Okay, so I know these problems seem scary, but you can see that with a Venn diagram, they're they're uh, not so bad so take a picture of these problems and I want you to try number 29 start by labeling each circle so the first circle would be uh, G for grapes and the second circle would be uh, A for apples, and the third circle would be O for oranges. You can put maybe O-R, O-R-A, so you don't confuse that with, uh, with the, the number zero. And the second step is to write the intersection of all three of them. That's where you start, and then you kind of go backwards. So try 29, and when you come back, we'll do it together. Okay, we're back. Four baskets contain all three. I got that from there. And five baskets had none of the none of these types of fruit, so I got that from there. And we're told nine of the baskets contain grapes and apples. So that's this intersection here. Should be a total of nine. But I only see four, so we have to add five. Seven of the baskets contain oranges and grapes. So this should be a total of seven here. I only see four, so we have to add three. And 10 of the baskets contain apples and oranges. So this should be a total of 10 baskets. I only see four. So we need an extra, uh, or we need an additional six. 20 of the baskets contained apples. Okay, so there should be 20 baskets total in this circle. I only see 15, so I need five more baskets. And 15 of the baskets contain grapes. So we need 15 total in this circle. 
and I see 12, so we need three more. And I think that's about it. So we're looking for how many baskets had oranges but no apples or grapes. So we're looking for this region down here. So we'll take the total number of baskets they sold, subtract all these numbers. Whoops. Um, you see a lot of fives here, so if I count seven numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers. That should be right. So 36 minus 5 minus 3 minus 5 minus 3 minus 4 minus 5 minus 6 is 5. Five baskets contained oranges, but no apples or grapes. So if you got that right, excellent. Okay, go ahead and try number 30. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So 16 pizzas had none of the toppings. Um, 13 pizzas had all three of the toppings. And 25 had pepperonis and mushrooms. And let's write the... Uh, Let's label everything first, probably we should do that. So pepperoni, mushrooms, and sausage. So 25 had pepperonis and mushrooms. So that should be here, 25 total in there, but I only see 13. So we need 12 more. 21 had sausage and mushrooms. So this is 21 total here, but I only see 13. So we need eight more there. 39 had uh, m uh, mushrooms. Um, so 39 had mushrooms. So it should be a total of 39 here, but I count uh, 33. So we need six more there. Um, and 54 of the pizzas had pepperonis on them. Now I notice we're missing a region here, so let me go back. Uh, 20 of them had pepperonis and sausage. That's the one I missed. So we should have 20 here. So we need 7 to make it a total of 20. 54 of the pizzas had pepperonis on them. So we should have 54 total in this circle. But I see... Um, 32, so 54 minus 32 is uh, 42, 52, it should be 22 pepperoni pizzas, pizzas that only had pepperonis and not the other toppings. So now we're ready to go. We take the total 85 pizzas and subtract all these numbers. And we should have our answer. So 85 minus 16 minus 22 minus 12 minus 13 minus 7 minus 6 minus 8 is 1. There's actually only one pizza that has only sausage and nothing else. So if you got that right, excellent. Okay, so that was the class today. If you'd like to take screenshots of all the work that we did to help you with your homework or to study for tests, go ahead and do that now. Here's screenshot number one. And number two. Number three. Number four. Number five and number six 
and number seven, number eight, and number nine, and number ten, but don't go before you get your homework. Let's take a look at the homework. Remember, the homework is not optional. Here's screenshot number one of the homework. And number two. And number three. And number four. And number five. But don't go before you get the answers. Here's the answers. So be sure to do that homework completely and correctly. Remember, it's not enough just to attempt the homework. It must be done correctly, which is why you have to check your answers. And if you get the wrong answer, go back and figure out what you did wrong. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next class.